It was obviously an exceedingly difficult and at times scary weekend for all of us. And I know that many Chicagoans are feeling like I am, which is weary and uncertain. But we will get through this because we must and we can. We have the strength as individuals, as communities, and as a city to rise above this moment and push forward, and we will. We made a lot of hard decisions over the weekend, and I know some of them were challenging for people. But I also have hope today on how we will move forward and heal as a city together. First, I want you to see just a sample of the public servants who have been working hard, literally night and day, to make sure that we are responding to the needs of residents all across the city. These are incredible public servants and community leaders who are at the ready to help, and they have been. Superintendent Brown, Commissioner Ford of the Fire Department, Commissioner Escareno of the Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Department, Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwady, Buildings Commissioner um, Judy Friedland, Streets and Sanitation Commissioner uh, Mr. Tully, OEMC uh, Director uh, Rich Guidas. We also are uh, pleased to see with us today Malcolm Crawford of the Austin African American Business Networking Association. Thank you for being here, sir. Now I will speak to our broader long-term response efforts in a moment, but I want to provide an update on some immediate public safety strategy. Following the damage and violence that we saw Saturday in our downtown and loop area, we made the necessary decision of limiting access to only residents, businesses, police officers, and essential workers that live and operate and are employed in those areas. We needed to assess the damage and begin the recovery process. We also did this in order to direct our police and other public safety neighborhoods, particularly on the south and the west sides, to those neighborhoods that had been targeted by the same destructive forces that we saw Saturday night in the downtown area. And that effort continued yesterday evening and will continue today as we strategically deploy resources in our neighborhoods, focusing on their commercial corridors, which have been targets of looting and violence and serve as the economic lifeblood of so many communities, particularly on the south and the west side. In addition to our public safety personnel, um, we will be deploying and moving personnel from our streets and sanitation department, our water department, our department of transportation, our buildings and business affairs and consumer protection into our neighborhoods on the south and the west side to assess the damage, to assist small businesses and local chambers of commerce so that we can start the process now of rebuilding our key commercial corridors in our neighborhoods. We will be deploying mayor's office personnel to assist in these cleanup efforts. And I wanna be absolutely clear on this. There is no way, no way that we would ever let any neighborhood receive more resources and protection than any others, ever. And that certainly didn't happen over the course of the weekend. What we saw last night is completely heart-wrenching to me personally, and I know to many of you who I have spoken to and heard from. The updates that I received all day and night from our aldermen, from local community leaders, about the attacks on local storefronts, and in particularly our small black-owned businesses, was nothing short of devastating. I know <clears throat> that for many of you, your life's work went into developing these businesses 
and commercial centers. I know that for many of you, your blood, sweat, and tears went into recruiting businesses to come support the vibrancy of your communities. And I want you to hear from me. Not only do I know that, I and we will be your partner in rebuilding. We will not let our city be in shambles. When I appeared on the west side last October to announce our Invest Southwest initiative, 750 million city dollars that I committed to make sure that we were reversing the decades of neglect and lack of investment in these communities. My resolve was certain and clear. It is no less, no less now. And if anything, I'm even more determined because I know the need is even more great after what we've seen over the last 24 and 48 hours. We will rebuild, and the city of Chicago government will lead those rebuilding efforts. We are not going to leave our neighborhoods behind. That will not happen on my watch. Now, I've heard some folks imply that police services and resources weren't distributed equally yesterday or that somehow we chose to protect the downtown at the expense of the communities. Putting aside how deeply offensive that is for me as a black woman, for the superintendent as a black man, and these other officers of high rank who grew up in these neighborhoods and communities and proudly serve them every single day. The fact of the matter is exactly the opposite was true. The strategy yesterday was to add, add more personnel and services to the neighborhoods on the south and west side. And that's what happened. The fact is that the violence that we saw and the looting that we saw spread like a wild fire. And let me just share with you how I know this to be true. Yesterday, the 911 center received 65,000 calls in one 24-hour period, and about 50,000 more than what you normally receive in a typical day. 50,000 more calls for service across the city. Of course, Nothing is typical about these times. And to be clear, as the day wore on, every half hour, there were a thousand calls every 30 minutes. And in some periods, in the late afternoon and evening, those calls reach over 2,000 calls per 30 minute, all far exceeding normal call volumes. And between Friday and Sunday, there were over 10,000 calls for looting alone. Now the superintendent will speak more to what the specific deployments were and what we were seeing yesterday, but be clear, we, the police department, was responding to these calls as best they could with a significant amount of additional resources on the south and the west side. The challenge was, it was everywhere, everywhere. So if we had a police department three times the size, it would have been difficult to keep up with the calls for service yesterday. Now I know that's cold comfort, but I wanna be clear, that we didn't stand by and let the South and the West Side burn, as unfortunately some people are propagating. That's just simply not true. This is an all hands on deck moment, and not just for law enforcement, but for all of city government, but also for all of you. As we've been saying over the last couple of days, we need all people of goodwill 
from the faith community, from community leaders to stand up and rise with us and not allow the criminal element to overwhelm the hard work and sacrifice of so many all over the city. We can't allow that to happen, and we will not allow that to happen. We will come together as a community, linked arm in arm, fates join together to make sure that we speak with one voice, that in Chicago, we will stand strong and united together. I want to talk a little bit about the specifics that what residents can expect today. There will be street closures along commercial neighborhoods and designated hotspots so that we can allow for businesses to be boarded up, debris to be cleaned. And we will do that in conjunction with ward superintendents and aldermen. In respect to our public transit, our citywide CTA train and bus service resumed earlier this morning. However, we will continue to bypass uh, stops located near the central business district. Residents, employees in need of the latest transit information can visit the CTA's website, transitchicago.com. Now, Dr. Artie will also provide details on this in a moment, but I ask her to be here to specifically speak to the other danger that we cannot lose sight of, and that is the fact that what we have seen over these last few days is people abandoning the very public health guidance, social distancing, staying home, that we have taken and made progress during the midst of this pandemic. I said this before and I'll say it again. COVID-19 has not disappeared from Chicago. It is very much our present. And we worry about the thousands of people that have been out in the streets over the last few days Please, in exercising your First Amendment rights, or if you were out for any other reason, you have now put yourself at risk. And we need you to isolate yourself. We need you to think about and be conscious of whether or not you are experiencing any signs or symptoms of COVID-19. God forbid that we see a spike that overwhelms our healthcare resources, just as we saw light at the end of the tunnel. But we need now to be careful and to take precautions, and Dr. Artie will speak more to that in a moment. I want to take this moment again to applaud the men and women of the Chicago Police Department and the men and women of the Chicago Fire Department. Bodies are weary, people are tired, but you've been doing heroic work. Now, there have been some reports of misconduct on a part of our personnel, and if that is so, we will investigate and we will get to the bottom of it. We will not spare any resource to do so. And if you believe that you've been mistreated by the police, I urge you to file a, a complaint. You can reach COPA, Civilian Office of Police Accountability by dialing 311. We were not going to abandon our values around police reform and accountability and holding officers responsible. The superintendent has said it multiple times. Now is the time for us to double down on our training around constitutional policing and understanding that respectful constitutional engagement with the people we are all sworn to serve is the most powerful tool beyond your gun and your badge. And I believe in my heart that the vast majority of police officers understand that. But if someone has crossed the line, we will hold them accountable, even in this moment. No excuses. I also want to thank the call takers and dispatchers and police and fire that have been handling these unprecedented volumes with tremendous calm and grace. They are often the unsung heroes of our first responders, and I want to make sure that they get their due. 
they hear your stress, they hear your trauma, and they take that home with them. So the fact that they are managing and doing their job in these unprecedented times is something we cannot lose sight of. I wanna thank the streets and sanitation workers, the water management workers, trans transportation and CTA workers who are also managing through in difficult circumstances. Your professionalism and service to our city and residents throughout all of the challenges we've been facing over the last 10 weeks and particularly over the last few days has been inspiring and our entire city is grateful. To our residents, I want you to know that we are doing absolutely everything to protect you and keep you safe. To be sure, it's been challenging, but our resolve is no less. Our resolve is complete and we will get the job done. What we have experienced over these past few days has been unsettling and devastating and unranging. I've had a range of emotions myself, from despair to anger to frustration, but I have never lost my hope. And I urge you to hold on to that hope. That's what will propel us forward and help us heal. There's not a single person here in Chicago or across the country who has not been affected by what we've been seeing and reading in the news. I had an exchange this morning with one of the lawyers for George Floyd, who's a personal friend and somebody I know. And he said to me, Mayor, I'm committed to making sure that we right the wrong, not only for Mr. Floyd and his family, and that's true, but also for the decades of wrongs that have been committed. I join him in that fight. That's who I am. That's who, how I got here. And we are all committed and united and repulsed by what we saw in Minneapolis. I understand that the anguish and pain that many people are feeling, its roots stretch back across our history and reach the very fibers of our society, stemming from that original sin. We stood at this podium yesterday and Reverend Otis Moss from Trinity delivered, I think, a very powerful message and talked both about COVID-19, but also COVID-16-19. If you haven't seen those words, I commend them to you. We have a lot of work to do to heal the wrongs, and we will do that together. We need to confront and reconcile this anguish, and I promise you that we will here in Chicago. But at this moment, right now, our focus has to be on the physical safety of our residents, our families, and our businesses. The violence and destruction that we have seen has been disgraceful to our city and to the meaning of this moment. But above all, our residents and our business owners have personally, deeply been affected. And we need you to stay focused and be with us in this fight so that we can recover who we are as a city and move forward. We can and we will rise above this moment, but only by staying together, only by wrapping our arms around each other, only by talking and practicing love and showing hope and compassion and empathy for our neighbors. This is what's gotten us through this terrible pandemic, and we cannot abandon those values now, even in the face of this hardship that we have seen that's devastated so many neighborhoods. We have to lean into our faith. We have to lean into our values and our sense of community to bring back what we have lost and be able to move forward. I'm committed to that and I hope you are and I hope you will join me and the tens of thousands of others 
who have already started the process of cleaning up, boarding up, and thinking about the promise that always comes with the new day. Thank you. Superintendent Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Let me start out by recounting the number of arrests, the number of guns recovered, shootings, murders, and injured officers on yesterday. There were 699 arrests on just yesterday, primarily for looting in our city. 461 of those 699 arrests were on the south and west side. Over 64 guns were recovered. 132 officers were injured on just yesterday. There were 48 shootings and 17 lives lost due to homicidal violence just on yesterday. Here's an example of our strategy as it relates to the looting seen in our neighborhoods. To the untrained eye, I've heard reports of officers just standing by watching as people loot uh, our businesses in our neighborhoods, primarily, as I mentioned before, on the south and west side. And, and that untrained eye would say, why don't cops do something? I was on the ground in the field, and I watched these looters strategically do looting in one area only to try to flank our officers uh, on the back and hit the target they intended. I was at police headquarters. There was a store, electronic store on the corner. And this strategy was used by a crowd that came up to headquarters intending on destroying that facility and burning our cars. Instead, our officers sent a smaller contingent to the store to repel uh, those looting. While our line officers held the backside of police headquarters uh, for a larger crowd that wanted to get into our police headquarters. We saw this time and time again. Looters uh, do one thing to draw us in one direction, only for their purpose to intend to distract us from uh, their intended target in another area. And so, our, you know, our officers are very, very well trained. Uh, Chief Cato, Chief Waller, Chief Hope, Chief Toronto all saw where, uh, number one, we wanted to protect uh, our neighborhoods. We wanted to protect our neighborhoods. Uh, the, the attack was on the, primarily on the south and west sides. But they did not take the bait. They strategically arrested looters over 699, while at the same time flanking and outflanking and outsmarting these looters' intended targets. Some of the intended targets were our officers. We had an officer who had a heart attack yesterday. We had an officer who had a broken arm yesterday. A another 130 officers were injured, bruised, and broken. And they get drawn into the crowd without enough officers to support them and then they get beat and pummeled. And so we strategically waited until we had enough resources to repel the crowd rather than sending in smaller numbers of officers who ended up getting injured and have to be rescued by our officers. We saw this time and time and time again throughout Saturday's looting. I wanna thank these officers. They are very professional. They have been very patient. I, I heard a lot of people say who are not trained sworn officers say, I, I wouldn't have had that kind of patience. People hit me, I'm gonna hit them back. People throw excrement on me, I'm gonna throw it back on them. People try to throw and, and burn our vehicles. I'm gonna retaliate. But this is a noble profession. And those who are sworn to an oath to conduct themselves in the most professional way deserve to wear that badge. Those who don't will be held accountable. And that is clear. So I want to thank these officers. 
I want to thank our partners, both the National Guard, State Police, and our federal partners for all their support, along with other city services. I want to thank Richard Guidance. I want to thank Streets and Sanitations. I want to thank the Fire Department for all of their support. This has been a collaborative effort to control our city in the face of these threats. While on the protest line in the field, supporting my officers on yesterday, there was a small group of peaceful protesters who came to express their First Amendment rights. And, and it was very emotional. It became emotional for me. And they said one thing that I want to share with you. This one young black female who couldn't have been more than 21 years old kept repeating to the officers standing in line, say his name. She would say, say his name, meaning George Floyd. I mean, it was a chant that just built and built and built, say his name. She meant acknowledge Mr. Floyd's death, unjustly death, murder, say his name. And, and what I'm embarrassed is I was out in the field, I was holding the line supporting my officers, I whispered his name. When she chanted, say his name, I silently thought, yeah, Mr. Floyd was murdered. And we saw it on live TV. And I'm part of the profession that those officers in Minneapolis painted with a broad brush. But today, publicly, I want to say his name. As a police leader of the second largest police department in the country, Mr. George Floyd, we grieve with you and your family. We are embarrassed by the cops in Minneapolis' use of force, asphyxiating you on the streets of Minneapolis. We stand with Mr. Floyd's family. But to the rioters and looters, you disgrace the name of Mr. Floyd by your actions. Hate can never drive out hate. Evil can never drive out evil. Two wrongs can never make a right. An eye for an eye leaves both of us blind. We will enforce these laws in this city. We will hold you accountable. What you've done in the cover of night will be brought to the light and we will pursue justice.